Good evening, everybody. This is Mike Cooper, Calvary Chapel of Dab Island. We're back in our the book of Ecclesiastes 7 uh, this evening. We're going to study verses, or yeah, 7, 15 through 8, 1 this evening. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We can come together again, Lord, on a Wednesday night and study your word. And it's such a blessing, Lord, to do this online with everybody else. And we pray that you walk among us, Lord. Even though we are online, we know you're capable of that. And we just pray that you'll you'll speak to us tonight, Lord. You will do the speaking and that you'll teach us your word, Lord. And, and uh, give us what we need to know, Lord, each one of us. And help us to walk in you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. The book of Ecclesiastes is the most exhaustive investigation ever made as to the value and profit of various lifestyles. The searcher is King Solomon, who records for us the faithful, objective, and relevant report of what he found in a search in, the book, in this book that took years of his life to accomplish. By the middle of the seventh chapter, where we start here today, he can say, I have seen everything. In fact, he opens this section with, with those very words in verse 15. In verse 15 it says, In this meaningless life of mine I have seen both of these, the righteous perishing in their righteousness and the wicked living long in their wickedness. You know, this section of Ecclesiastes deals with how to properly and realistically evaluate life. We've already seen that prosperity isn't always good. To be wealthy and materially well off is by no means the answer to the hunger of the human heart. We've also seen the opposite truth that adversity is not always bad. Some of our best times are those times when we don't have much, when things are tough. In this section, beginning in verse 15, we learn still another accompanying truth. And that is that the righteous are not always righteous. In fact, this section declares two great truths. First, that in the real world, there is a lot of phony righteousness. And secondly, that true wisdom, therefore, is hard to find. The searcher is saying that a person can't tell who the righteous are by whether they live a long time or not. In other words, as the Proverbs say, the good often die young. But the wicked can live long, to a long, ripe age. There is such a thing as a dirty old man. He does exist. The bumper sticker says he, he needs love too. Verses 16 through 19 here, where, it is, where this truth is developed, is a greatly misunderstood passage. The searcher says in verse 16, Do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? Verse 17 says, Do not be over-wicked, and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? Verse 18, it is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. And then in verse 19, wisdom makes one wise person more powerful than ten rulers in a city. You know, that scripture is probably popular for a lot of people because it seems to advocate moderation in both good and evil. The searcher seems to be saying, don't be too righteous and don't be too wicked either. But a little of both doesn't really hurt. We've all heard somebody say religion is all right in its place, but don't let it interfere with your pleasure. No, in other words, they feel that there should be moderation in all things. You know, in trying to understand, however, we... We have to notice very carefully what the searcher is saying here. The second verb of verse 16, do not make yourself overwise, is the key to understanding the verbs. In the grammar, this is called a reflexive verb. That's why the word yourself is included here. 
What the searcher is really saying is don't be wise in yourself. Do not be wise in your own eyes in regard to your righteousness. This is a warning against self-righteousness, and properly so. Self-righteous is the attitude of people who regard themselves as righteous because of the things they don't do. That is, in my judgment, one of the curses of the church today. Christians saying, well, I don't do this and I don't do that, so I'm fine. You know, in the New Testament calls this fairyism. And the searcher rightly labels it wickedness. In his studies in the book of Job, we learn that wickedness is expressed not only by murder, thievery, and sexual misconduct, but it's also by bigotry and racism, pompousness, cold disdain by critical judgment attitudes, by harsh, sarcastic words, by vengeful and vindictive actions. You know, the evangelical prig, male or female, is a wicked person. Not only is self-righteousness wicked, but the opposite stream is wicked too. The searcher goes on to say here, the foolish casting on of all moral restraints, the abandoning of one's self-discipline and going in for wild and riotous living is also wickedness. Furthermore, each of these lifestyles is mutually self-destructive. They both result in the same thing. Why would you destroy yourself, he asked the self-righteous. Why would you decide, or why should you die before your time? He says to the self-indulgent. In either case, they destroy a part of your humanity. You know, this may be true even physically. Self-indulgent, the self-indulgent might die in a drunken brawl or a car accident while self-righteous will probably die of ulcers or a heart attack, a result of soft, indulgent living. So the proper attitude toward life is found here in verse 18, where it says it is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. That's the consistent position of the scripture, Old and New Testament alike. We are not to withdraw from the world and attempt to escape its evil. We are not to gather our robes of righteousness about ourselves and look down on our noses with disdain on those who live morally unrighteous lives. No, it's good to take hold of true righteousness, but it's also good not to withhold yourself from the world. Be out in it. Live in it. Be in touch with it. Don't ask to avoid it. Don't hide in a spiritual cocoon, but don't go along with its unrighteous and hurtful attitudes and practices. The godly way to live, of course, is he who fears God shall come forth from them all. We've seen this in the phrase, the man who fears God, many times in his book. To fear God is a full-orbed truth. It means not only to respect God, but to acknowledge his presence in your life. Not merely at the end of your life someday, but right now. You know, to fear God is to know that he sees all that you do and that it's in his hands that send circumstances to your life. The knowledge of God's power, wisdom, and love his willingness to accept you, to change you, to forgive you, to restore you, and to stand by you are all parts of fearing God. To fear God is to know how to live in the midst of the world and yet not, and yet not be self-righteous, priggish, smug, and, and complacent. That's the kind of wisdom. That kind of wisdom. It gives strength to the wise man more than ten rulers that are in any city, as it tells us in verse 19. It's better to learn to live that way than to have ten influential friends in high places who can bail you out. 
You know, then uh, there used to be a guy, a guy by the name of DeLorean in the U.S. who was an automobile magnet. He got into trouble for tra trafficking drugs years ago. Is an example of this very same thing. Here's one of the wealthiest men in the world at that time, with influential friends all over the world, spending his days in jail because no one would bail him out. That's a commentary on what the searcher found. The man or woman who learns to fear God in a full orb sense that we've been talking about is much better off than the, off than the one who has a parcel of influential friends. So Solomon now sets forth the truth that we live in a fallen world. There is no righteousness apart from the gift of God. All have been infected by the virus of evil, he declares in verses 20 through 22. In verse 20, it says, Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. Don't add except me to this statement. The scripture says this over and over and over again. The searcher then goes on to tell us of how we will know the truth of this. In verse 21, do not pay attention to every word people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you. And in verse 22, for you know in your heart that many times you yourself have cursed others. You know, this unchanging position of Scripture is, as Paul declares in Romans 3, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. Isaiah puts it this way. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own, our own way. That's in Isaiah 53.6. You know, in the honesty of our hearts, we know that. We can hear it if we listen to what people say, especially when they're angry, frustrated, or upset about something. Listen to what a Christian mutter under their breath when they are caught in traffic. That's what the searcher is saying here. Don't take it too seriously. This is a revelation of the fact that all of us live in a fallen world. We all struggle with fallen nature, which will manifest itself in any possible moment of wickedness, frustration, or anger. That's why if you hear your servant cursing, you realize that he is suffering from the same problem as you are. Don't take it so seriously that you get, you know, all upset and threaten to fire him. But remember that you are in the same boat. Everyone is foolish at times. In fact, the worship invites you to remember that in your own heart that you have done the same thing many times. This shows how refreshingly honest the scriptures are. They confront us with reality about life. For the very reason that there is none righteous on the earth, the searcher concludes in the latter half of this chapter that true godly wisdom is very hard to find indeed. He looked for it. In verse 22, uh, 23, it says, All this I tested by wisdom, and I, and I said, I am determined to be wise, but this was beyond me. In verse 24, he says, Whatever exists is far off and most profound. Who can discover it? In 25, so I turned my mind to understand, to investigate, to search out wisdom and the scheme of things and to understand the stupidity of wickedness and the madness of folly. We've seen before how he described this search, the earnest, long search that he undertook to investigate all philosophies in life, seeking to discover the secret of life. He says that he had sought it in himself, first of all. Also remember that this is written by King Solomon, who was noted in his own time as the wisest man in the world. With a reputation for wisdom, he sought in his own life 
to find the secret. As he puts it here, I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. What an honest confession. You know, he found himself shortchanged, unable to understand himself. There is probably no one thing that we are more confident in this world is the notion that we know ourselves. We all think we know ourselves. How many times have you ever heard someone say, no one understands me? The clear implication is, I alone understand me. The revelation of Scripture, however, tells us that if there is one person in this world you don't know, it's you. You do not understand yourself. We'll be puzzled and confused if you try to solve the riddles of the life by thinking we understand ourselves. That which is far off and deep, very deep, who can find it out, says Solomon. He realizes that the issue lies deep within himself. To try to understand yourself is very difficult. It's like a man trying to look at his own face without using a mirror. You can only imagine what you really look like. The searcher found it impossible to solve the riddles of his own feelings because he didn't understand himself. He goes on to tell us that as he thought, he realized that what he was looking for was the secret of the mystery of evil. Have you ever wrestled with that? Have you ever said to yourself after you've done something, why did I do that? I knew it was wrong. I knew it would hurt somebody. Why did I say that? You know, you're wrestling with the same problem the searcher faced. That great question, the mystery of evil. The searcher says that he didn't find the answer by wisdom, but by trying to reason it out. What he did find was really revealing. The first thing he discovered was that most of us find, when we seek the key to our life apart from God, bitterness and death. This is a remarkable, remarkable, a remark, remarkable revelation of what a keenly intelligent, very resourceful man found out about life. Now we have to remember, Solomon is honestly recording his own experience here. He's revealing himself. In verses 26 through 29, it says, I find more bitter than death the woman who is a snare whose heart is a trap and whose hands are chains. The man, the man who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner she will ensnare. In verse 27, look, says the teacher, this is what I have discovered, adding one thing to another to discover the scheme, the scheme of things. While I was still searching but not finding, I found one upright man among a thousand but not one upright woman among them all. And then verse 29, This only have I found. God created mankind upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. So he found two things here. First, he found that he was trapped by sexual seduction. He went looking for love. Many a man and woman here this evening can echo what he's saying. He went looking for love and thought he would find it in a relationship with a woman. He went looking for that which would support him, strengthen him, and make him feel that life was worth living. But what he found was nothing but a fleeting sexual thrill. He found himself involved with a woman who didn't give him what he was looking for at all. He still felt the same emptiness as before. You know, I read an article about a young woman who once told about how she sought the answer to the hungers of her life in one relationship after, after another with men. 
She said that she woke up one morning living, lying in bed with a man she had met just the night before. As she looked at this guy sleeping beside her, she said she felt more, or she felt the most intense loneliness that she had ever experienced. She realized then that sex was compounding, not solving the emptiness and loneliness in her life. She went on to talk about how she found a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus and became a Christian and testified to the fullness she found in that relationship. What a confirmation her record is to what we found in this passage. The searcher also honestly records the way of escape. He says the man who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner she will ensnare. Now we have to remember this is a man who had 700 wives and 300 concubines. He was involved sexually with, with 1,000 women altogether. In all that experience, sexual athlete that he was, he found nothing to satisfy the searchings of the heart. But, he says, he, he did come to realize that the man who fears God, who understands God, who, whose eyes are open and whose heart is taught by the word of God, will escape this. In the first nine chapters of Proverbs, where Solomon also wrote, he passes on his experience in this area to the young men to show them how to escape this kind of empty experience in their lives. Not only did he find himself trapped by sexual seductiveness, but he says he was also puzzled by a strange enigma. Recorded in verses 27 and 28, one man among a thousand I found, but a woman among all of these I have not found. We have to look at this really carefully, Christian. As he went through life, he occasionally found a loyal, trustworthy, godly, wise man who could be a true friend, a man of integrity, but he never found a woman like that. One of the thousand women he was involved with, which he never found one he could, whom he could trust. Why? Surely it wasn't because Solomon was a male chauvinist pig, as some of you might think, or be tempted to think. In chapter 8 of Proverbs, he uses a woman as a symbol as a symbol of true, godly wisdom. I'm sorry, in chapter 31 of Proverbs, he uses a woman to symbolize a true godly wisdom. In the 31st chapter of Proverbs, he holds up a woman as the supreme example of one who lives a life pleasing to God. In this chapter and all around the earth for its ex exaltation of godly womanhood, we just studied this chapter. Solomon wasn't a woman hater. That wasn't his problem. We can understand why he says that it says that he honestly records here because of what was going on in his search. His problem is that when he sought to relate to a woman, he was stymied by the fact of immediate sexual involvement. And that canceled out everything discovering who the woman really was. That's the explanation for his words here. Solomon had no such problem with men. He wasn't gay. When he sought to relate to a man, he could understand him, hear him, and realize what was going on inside unhindered by sexual distortions or detours. But not so with a woman. One of the most important lessons we need to learn about life is that sex outside of marriage arrests the mutual process of discovery. It greatly hinders it. Which what you can't or you can't you can't discover who you are and who another person is when you're involved together in the wrongful sex. I've seen this happen many times with young people, including myself. 
It often happens with young people who are obviously growing in the Lord, who begin to know each other, to love one another, to discover things they liked and disliked. And then suddenly the relationship soured, the weirdness set in, things went wrong, they began to quarrel and fight. You know, invariably it turned out that they gave way to their temptations and had gone into sexual experiences together absolutely canceling out every attempt to discover who the other one was. The scriptures warn us carefully about premarital sex. That's why the searcher has to record, I could find a real man among a thousand, but I never found a woman like that. I'm sure there were women like that among those he knew. But he was incapable of finding one because he was just thinking about one thing. And finally, he sums up all of this up in verse 29, where it says, This only have I found, God created mankind upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. The trouble of this world listen with God. But the trouble of the world is for the man. You know, because we refuse to heed the wisdom of God and the word of God, we seek to find ways to circumvent what he is telling us. To find the richness of life despite or apart from the rulers of this life or the rules of this life that he has set forth. It can't be done. The inevitable, inevitable discovery of an honest search of, is that life can never be found except where God says it is found in a relationship with Him. So the searcher concludes this section in verse 1 of chapter 8 with a description of the value, true value of true godly wisdom. Here is another one of those misplaced chapter divisions, as far as I'm concerned. We have to read this as the closing part of chapter 7, and we're going to. Chapter 8, verse 1 says, Who is like the wise, who knows the explanation of things? A person of wisdom brightens their face and changes its hard appearance. You know, there's a marvelous force, fourfold description of what happens to the one of to the one who discovers the true wisdom and righteousness as a gift from God. One who walks with God in the fear of God. First, it will make that person a unique human being. It says, who is like the wise man? One of the follies of life is try to imitate someone else. The media constantly bombards us with this subtle invitation to look like, dress like, feel like, talk like, the most popular idol. Here in the Philippines is often an idol from South Korea. But if you succeed in that, you'll be nothing but a cheap imitation of another person. The glory of the good news is that when you become a new creature in Jesus Christ, you will be unique. There'll be no one like you. You'll become more and more like Christ, but unlike everyone else in personality. You'll be uniquely yourself. You won't be a copy, a cheap imitation, but an original from the Spirit of God. That's the first and most wonderful thing about salvation. Secondly, the searcher says, Godly wisdom will give you a secret knowledge. Who knows the explanation of things? The implication of that question is that the wise man knows. This is what Paul declares in 1 Corinthians 2. The person with the Spirit makes judgment about all things. That's in 1 Corinthians 2.15. The spiritual man is in a position to pass moral judgment on the value of everything, 
not because he's so smart, but because the God who teaches him is wise. Thirdly, such a man will experience a visible, visible joy. A man's wisdom brightens his face. God, grace, grace, grace is what makes the face shine, not grease. Grease is what they put into cosmetics to make the face shine or take away the shine, as the case may be. But it is grace that does it from within. Grace that makes the face shine because it is joy visibly expressed on the human face. Finally, it changes the very inner disposition of a person. The harshness of his countenance is changed. Have you ever watched somebody under the impact of the Spirit of God in his life soften, in his life soften, mellow, and grow easier to live with? That's the work of the Spirit of God. We can illustrate that truth of thousands of people here in the Philippines and elsewhere. But I choose to close this with a famous Christian of some generations ago. All of us, whether we know it or not, have sung the hymns of John Newton. One of our favorite hymns was written by him, An Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, That Saved a Wretch Like Me. That's John Newton's story. He was raised by a godly mother who prayed for all, him all of his life. As soon as he became a boy of age, he joined a slave trade, running slaves from Africa to England. He fell into wild, riotous living, involving himself in drunken brawls. He ended up at last, as he himself confesses, a slave of slaves actually serving some of the escaped slaves on the African coast, wretched, miserable, and hardly even alive. Then he found a voyage on a ship back to England and missed, and in the midst of a terrible storm in the Atlantic when he feared for his life, he was converted. He remembered his mother's prayers and he came to Christ. You know, the Spirit brought him to a place in his life and converted him. That's what the Spirit does. It draws us to Christ. One of the hymns is of his own hip testimony. It goes like this. An evil long I took delight, unawed by shame or fear, until a new object met my sight and stopped my wild career. I saw one hanging on a tree in agony and blood who fixed his languid eyes on me as near his cross I stood. Sure, never till my latest breath shall I forget that look. It seemed to change me, or to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. A second look he gave which said I freely Oh, forgive, my blood was for thy ransom paid. I died that you may live. And Levy did. He became one of the great Christians of England, author of many, many hymns in which he sought to set forth the joy, the radiance, the goodness, the gladness of his life that he had found in Jesus Christ. You know, I prayed just to ask you to help us to understand afresh what we regard oftentimes as the restrictions and limitations of life which God sets before us are not designed to keep us from joy. Joy is God's purpose for us. These apparent restrictions are designed to guard it so that we find it in the right way and at the right time. And then life will start to unfold in a fullness and gladness before us. Here the searcher is clearly declared that the, he emphasizes throughout the whole book of Ecclesiastes that it is the man or woman who finds the living God who discovers the answers to the riddles of life. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, Lord, how grateful we are for the honesty of your word, for its word for its clear and careful warnings about devious paths that many of us are tempted to go down and yet without rancor or threat these words come to us offering a way of escape, a way of life that will indeed satisfy us, Lord. Though it may bring pain and hardship at times, it will be from a Father's loving hand. Grant to us that we will take these words very seriously and begin to find them fulfilled in our own experience. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who loved us and gave himself for us, that we might find life in his name. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. I'll see you next week. God bless.